Professor Thomas Mons from Innsbruck University and AQT, the startup of quantum computing on trapped ion systems. I also would like to invite Professor Rafael Chaves from Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte and the International Institute of Physics in Natal. Yes, I have to apologize because uh, Dr. Dario Sassi Tober, uh, the CEO and the founder of the Von Braun Labs, could not come today because he has some problems, some issues, family issues. So unfortunately, he could not come to, to this round table, unfortunately. And the last one, but not less important, Professor Anna Predoyevich from Stockholm University, <laughs> the moderator of this round table. So please have a seat, and the show is yours. I hope. Is this microphone on? No. No. Yes. 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 Oh. Yes. No. 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 Yes. 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 No. It has a green light, so excellent, thank you. So uh, I'm sorry I'm sufficiently jet lagged that I didn't know should I say good afternoon, good morning or good evening, uh, but it doesn't matter. We're not here for the times of the day. We're today for quantum computers and the rolling microphones. Thank you. So, um, well, we, we would not be here if we were not interested in quantum computing. And we have seen that this is a very, very interesting topic that has become very important for academia, and more importantly, it has become a serious thing for industry. So here, today, we have three experts. And, um, well, I have some warm-up questions for them, but what I would actually like the most is that you use this opportunity and ask what you would like to know, okay? And don't be shy. Please be brutal, it's okay, it's allowed, they can take it. And um, maybe we should start already. So a little warm up, just you know, for, to get to know better each other. So um, what do you think, just on the side either of academia or industry, what was the largest breakthrough that you think that happened this year? And what do you expect is gonna be the next big breakthrough? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, so essentially, I, I come from a long career in the academia, so I have this this bias also, and now I am since some years um, in the entrepreneurial life. To be committed, I have just resigned to all my positions in the universities because you cannot make business uh, like that. Uh, but I will keep an appointment. So when you tell me breakthroughs, I would try to make the difference between breakthroughs for academic reasons and breakthroughs for technological business. You know. uh, so this year, um, for me, um, it is the strong arrival of uh, neutral atoms with uh, hundreds of qubits as a possibility of using digital analog quantum computing and coding done by my company, Kipu Quantum, to approach quantum advantage in the next couple of years. So that's for me um, the most important. Perhaps uh, academically it may not be considered by some experts, but it comes from the axis of Harvard, Michel looking with Quera Company, a spin-off, uh, Planck, uh, in, uh, sorry, in Munich, and, and Pascal in, in Paris. That's the way I see it. And um, yeah, if you tell me one, I would mention that. At least for me, it was a discovery. And that's something important, yes. Because neutral atoms was always the analog quantum simulator for academic things that are for the industry. You know, if you take all the nature papers of optical lattices, it's totally irrelevant, you know. It's absolutely irrelevant. It's just both have a model, you know, spin models that's for the industry, it's not relevant. And I defined yesterday in my talk the what is quantum advantage is when there are 100 people that you don't know that knock at your door and say, I want to pay you if you do this for me. So that's something that is missing in the academic world. That's what I think neutral atoms have raised to the possibility of making industrial uh, issues, and that I find it important. Um, yeah, so the 
breakthrough, I think, this year. It, it might sound a bit strange, but I think it was the Nobel Prize and the uh, Breakthrough Prize. <laughs> because, I we, mean, we will let them know. Don't worry. <laughs> um, and the reason is that, like, uh, I mean, we see how many people are interested in the topic, but uh, I think there was still some uh, skepticism in the community as a whole, like, uh, about quantum computers and quantum information. I remember like a talk that I gave like some years ago that uh, in, in the back I could hear like some old professor, ah, but this is not even physics. So, um, yeah, so I think this was important for the uh, community to have this, um, uh, well, to be recognized in the most, uh, in, in the highest possible standards. And um, in, Academia, like one thing that I really liked that happened this year was like this uh, silicon based uh, qubits that are happening now. Uh, so they are important for many uh, reasons. One of them is that, uh, well, they don't need like uh, this extreme uh, cooling. So like energetically they are a bit better and like you could use this uh, infrastructure that uh, people have developed in the last uh, decades to make uh, something that it's more scalable. So. I think this is really uh, an, an important development, yeah. Thomas? So then I repeat the negative one, and I'd say... Go ahead. I think uh, there was no real big breakthrough. It's like this, at least we managed to maintain a steady improvement on technology, but it's like what I'm missing, and which is why I'm saying there is not a big breakthrough, if you look, for instance, in like quality of GHZ states as a metric over time, that's been growing linearly for the last two decades. If you look at the goals from IBM, Honeywell, and others when they say quantum volume and so on, they, they talk about doubling the quantum volume or a factor of 10 in volume. But given the way it's defined, they officially state we want to add one qubit for IBM or we want to add three qubits for Honeywell per year. So like their official goals are linear growth. And it's, it's like, it's, it's amazingly hard. So it's, it's, there is a reason why they do it. I mean, they will be held to these statements. And it's, it's, it's like succeeding is good. But you see that the goals that they set themselves are linear. And, and if, if we celebrate linear growth, uh, then yes, we will wait the next three, four decades until we have maybe some cool idea on how to do things differently. Uh, but for the moment, I just, it, I, I don't see anything which accelerates. It's, it's like there's a steady growth and it's good there's a steady growth, but I don't see this step function where suddenly error rates went down by a factor of 10 or qubits are controlled by a factor of 100 more. It's just like, it's all linear. And that's a little bit of a concern from my point of view. But, but on that, what you just mentioned, do you believe that there is some I would I say recipe, how can we go faster? Do we, do we, do we <laughs> encourage, do we, sh should we just now at a certain point no, say we, we don't cheer to this, we're going to cheer only to real no, breakthrough? When you look at technology development, it's usually always, it's like one approach gets superseded by another one. It's, at least for me with IONS, when we look at it, we had the, the, the Cirac Solar Gate in the like early 2005 to 2010. And that was entirely replaced by the Mermosurans interaction. And it could be that this gets now entirely replaced by the light shift gate, which again has low, significantly lower, let's say, dependencies. And it's, it's like doing the same, yeah, doesn't get you significantly farther. You have to try something new, uh, which looks good. So the takeaway so message, good try something new. <laughs> ideas? I will, I will run around kick you, do not stop me on that way. I'm going to kill the moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, my, uh, my question, my observation uh, goes to Rafael. Uh, because I, I come from the academic media. So um, I'm a bit confused. I'm a bit confused, I must acknowledge is recognized, but that um, about physics, uh, my traditional formation, it's a theoretic, theoretical physics. So looking to understand how nature works, 
the universe as we see gravitational waves, black holes, things that we have discovered recently that have been proposed from before, and then you, wow, it's, it's true, okay? And there's this whole parallel world of computation, uh, which I don't know, I'm becoming, trying to become uh, in the field. Uh, but it's, it's to me something like it's a society field. It's a society field of a technology field, communication field, internet field, something uh, with which we deal in everyday life, right? So I'm not saying that we do not have applications. This is not important. It's not, not. but uh, it's that I feel that I have the sensation that we have changed our scope, our main, uh, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? Are we looking for the laws of nature, or are we looking just uh, as a kind of engineering, or, or are we looking as a kind of uh, engineering tool to arrive to useful things for the technology, solve industry problems? I feel now not like much as a physicist, but maybe we will turn some kind of engineering. Uh, that, uh, well, so so let me just uh, see if I understood. Like, uh, what you were saying is that now it's not really like about basic science anymore. It's more like uh, applications. But but I, I mean, I, I think that there is still room for both, right? Like, uh, if you look at the beginning of quantum mechanics, like uh, more than one century ago, it was like it started as like very basic uh, questions trying to understand the world, and no one could. Uh, uh, forecast like everything that would come after, right? Like the development of uh, all these uh, technologies that we have today. So there are these old estimates already that like uh, the GDP of developed countries like is uh, between 30 and 50 percent based on uh, heavily based on quantum mechanics. So I mean, I'm s I'm still a scientist. I'm I, I work at the university doing very basic science, but I. And this is what I plan to continue uh, doing. But at the same time, like all these things that we've been developing in, in the last uh, four decades and most uh, 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 prominently in the last 20 years, they do have a lot of nice applications that, uh, I mean, of course, that the result is hype, but the things that really could help a uh, change in the world. So this is very important, of course. So I would say that we are reading the best of the two worlds. We can still do a lot of very, uh, fundamental science, but have that can have a uh, world changing application. So my, my answer is that we have uh, room for both. But one thing that I, I'm seeing, and this is a bit, uh, this makes me uh, uh, worried, is that a lot of these, uh, of the calls and uh, grants and money is really focused now on applications. It's very hard to get money now to do a uh, basic science. And I think this is a problem. And in like our own the world, I see this uh, happening. It's like about applications, quantum computers, like better sensors. But okay, and what about the uh, foundations? So this is uh, an issue. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is kind of a follow-up of his. Yesterday, uh, Enrique, you presented a concept called quantum winter. And I would like you to expand about uh, around this concept and ask the opinion of the other members about what they think about that. Quantum? Uh, quantum winter. You said ah, that. Ah, the quantum winter. Ah. Uh, yeah. What is the so meaning yeah, of that? That's not, that's not, you know, I like to invent things, but this I didn't invent. In fact, my, my, my main motivation is to disinvent that concept. It is kind of uh, predicted, and it, it was used, for example, for for um, artificial intelligence, um, if you if you go to Google, just not to develop too much, there is this concept that that uh, artificial intelligence had already several winters. There is like studies of high curve, uh, curves and and winters. So somehow that uh, people have studied how technologies evolve, how hype happens, how people promise a lot, money arrives, then it reaches to a saturation and it goes down. And, 
and then suddenly they realize that it was there was most lies or, or just hopes and then it disappears then it stays there then after a while it starts again and it looks like AI had like two or three uh, winters so now for quantum computing people are speaking since a while already for the possibility of arrival of a quantum winter this means that all this level of investments as Rafael said that are growing exploding you, I mean you see Thomas saying linear growth so it it doesn't match there is a mismatch between investments uh, technological achievements ideas applications and so on and very likely this quantum winter will happen this means that in one two or ten years there may be a fall down in investments in research in companies companies will just go bankrupt or will merge or will be bought by large corporations and unlike that right so many people claim that quantum winter uh, uh, may happen soon you know and for me what what matters is the quantum winter of of creativity and this is for sure out of my company I don't see anything you know in terms of creativity I don't believe as I said in universal quantum computing I think that uh, just to counterpoint what what Thomas said I do believe that quantum advantage is there you know so um, just to, to keep the provocation level um, Sanadu has claimed a quantum advantage with um, their photonic setup using this boson sampling uh, Google claimed with 53 qubits, which was of course contested, as everybody knew that, at least I knew that. But if you make the same thing as Google with 65 qubits, then you burn all the other uh, critic. Or if you go to eight, everybody knows that every supercomputing center burns when, when you cross uh, all to all connectivity with incommensurate couplings of uh, 60 qubits. You know, that's pretty, pretty. So for me, Quantum supremacy, that means outperforming supercomputing centers, is trivial. It has happened already. You know, the only thing that is missing, as I said yesterday, is the smart encoding of useful problems that people would pay for in that setup. So for me, the difference between quantum supremacy and quantum advantage is on my shoulders of creativity and on yours. You know, and that's what we are working on. So we are planning to get it in a couple of years. Because, because the, the complexity and the Hilbert space dimension is there. We are missing just the, the proper encoding. Of course, not for universal fault tolerant quantum computer. This may take decades. As, as Thomas said, this is going uh, pretty slowly. And I don't believe it. And given that it will happen when I am dead, I don't care at all. So take away the message, smart encoding pays mortgage. So I, I, I just want to uh, compliment something. Uh, I saw a video of the, uh, Sabine Hosenfelder these days where she's sp like exactly speaking about uh, uh, the <laughs> quantum winter. And the end of the video, it's like she's saying, well, okay, it's going to happen. And soon you are going to uh, be able to discuss about multi-partite uh, entanglement with your uh, taxi driver. So like she's basically saying that we are going to be jobless. Like, okay, we are doing all these things, like the investment she's, will stop. She's negative. Again. She's, she's very negative, yes. She's always negative. She's always <laughs> negative, yeah. <laughs> but so I, I think the quantum meter is coming. Like, uh, it, it, it will happen. I mean, like, we cannot deliver what people expect, right? This is very clear. But at the same time, I don't think we are going to be uh, jobless because, I mean, quantum information has come and, like, uh, is having a very important uh, impact in many areas. So now high energy uh, physics, like uh, uh, people are talking about space time being like a, a consequence of uh, entanglement. So you have people like uh, talking about uh, quantum biology, like uh, possible quantum effects in some uh, uh, biological systems. So I think that uh, we, we have a lot of things to do with quantum information that have nothing to do with quantum computers. And if the winter is coming, we should maybe focus on uh, on these other applications. So, I mean, nothing against driving a Uber, but <laughs> I think we can uh, do other things, yeah. So maybe a last comment from my side. So I think it's a question of, like, what do you define as quantum winter? A little bit similar to what Krika said. It's like, are you, is, is a quantum winter for you because no investor is willing to give you money? Or is it quantum winter because the government doesn't like make grants in a certain direction anymore? 
or is it a quantum winter because we run of, out of ideas how to make things better? And I think um, if, if it's like, there might be something for investors because they, I mean, they don't do it because they like you. They want to make money. And if you look at the most, let's say, promising ones, they were all those three that went for a SPAC. And you can look at Rigetti. I mean, Rigetti is close for the, uh, to being delisted because they managed to get a valuation of even less than $1 for some time, starting at 10. And currently, their, their valuation is less than what they have on a bank account. It's, 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 it's like they, they have a valuation of, I think, 130 million, and the, the bank, the balance is 180 million. Um, the same actually with D-Wave, they started with $10, they are now at $2. And the same with INQ, which started at 10, had a peak at 30, everyone got rid of their shares, and they are now at 5. So in terms of like investors, will simply because there are no good examples, they will say, why should I invest if I step out, and I stepping out means I lose a third of, of my money. If, it, if I'm good, I lose only a half, and if it's bad, I lose one factor of 10 of my money. Um, I, I sincerely hope we will not run out of ideas. So at least on the academic level, we will always keep on working because there is also the other example. Look at solid state physics. I mean, we still do semiconductors and so on. It's not that we stopped in an academic level to do semiconductors, despite Intel, IBM, and Zeiss, and whoever works on industrial fabrication. We still look into new materials. We still look into new ideas of doing transistors. Can we go from, from current-based to capacity-based systems? Um, so on, on the research side, it's good, and, and I think the tricky part will be the government. The, to, to, to give governments the perspective to say an investor plans for three years and very likely it won't hopefully it won't be 40 years but it's very likely going to be closer to something like 10 years plus and it's rare for investors to say I plan for 10 to 20 years before it works and so it's like these three levers and they say like the investors will be hard the government might be manageable if actually it's the academics who, who help them have reasonable expectations. Because look what, when I look at what happens in Germany, it's like they, they put up, what was it? Um, half a billion of euros for quantum technologies. It's like Munich and Saxony and, and, and so on. Um, and they built less systems than what has been built in the flagship with, uh, I think, a, a effect of 10 less money. And so it's even to the point where I say, how can it be that one project gets 300 million to build three systems, and on the EU level, we got 10 million to buy two systems? And actually, the two systems work, and of whether the three systems, which cost a factor of 30 more, will work is completely unknown. And so if you, if you manage to piss off the government, then you're really screwed. Because it, at the end, for academics, that's where we get our money from. The only thing you can do is, is be honest with them. Because the investors, yeah, different deal. So the quantum winter for some areas, yes, and for the other one, we can fix it. Um, I was on a conference last week, and one of my students made a joke asking if there exists a quantum version of League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I've been thinking about it uh, since then, and I wonder if uh, what would be, be your vision about the state of art and the evolution of this kind of technology. We already know that the financial market has an eye on this kind of uh, on this field. But do you think this kind of uh, technology will evolve soon? And if the entertainment industry will invest on it, I would like to know about the opinion of the three of us. Thank you. You can't exclude it, but it's like just from my experience, if you talk with a computer scientist and you tell him, do something interesting, you have 50 bit. And they ask you, bit or gigabit? And it's like, no, no, bit, need a neither byte nor gigabyte nor like it's it's bit um, then most of the time say that's like three letters five letters and then then it's pretty much done 
um, then they, it's hard for them to see how they can apply the techniques. But then, yeah, you have to have a creative idea of like where can I use even this 50 bit in the background for something useful. Well, I, I don't have much to say about that, but like uh, I don't think as a as a technology I, we are very far from anything. But uh, maybe like on the conceptual level, like uh, doing things that are based on on quantum concepts, like a virtual uh, 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 reality where you perhaps can somehow experience like uh, superpositions or these sort of things. I mean, this would be very cool. So at the conceptual level, yeah, I, I think. Uh, there is a lot of uh, room for things, but uh, as a technology, I don't think so. Yeah, as I, I was saying yesterday, I do believe, in fact, my company, Quambia, is built under the assumption that with few qubits, uh, I'm playing with the fantasy uh, uh, that there is a business, not a technology and a business. I'll just give you one, one example. I think I mentioned this very fast yesterday, but just one example, uh, like a transducer, um, Imagine that you have two, three qubits, you run some algorithms, and then you make the measurements with feedback or not, right? Like Thomas was explaining this morning. And then just a question on how to map um, that uh, measurement signal into, into an audio signal so that you can call that a, a music um, signal coming out of measurement of qubits using, of course, um, the intrinsic um, randomness. Um, if you do that, because I have done it, work on that, right? We have created music. I mean, if you want later, I can show you. I have here some beautiful uh, quantum techno, quantum salsa, quantum samba. We have created that because if you just measure qubits, uh, hip hop doesn't come out, you know? So you, you need to create a classical algorithm and machine learning to extract the quantum data of the tomography so that you create a, now a signal audio and try to check now the latency, the time, and then create digital art and digital quantum art. Absolutely all that is just amazing, and nobody has ever done it. Now it is in the fashion. Also video games, for example, you know, you go, I, I, by the way, people think that I, I've never played, I don't like playing, I'm, I'm, I'm very busy, I have more interesting things to do, but, but we are working on, on quantum games, you know. And, and from that point of view, if you have, I, I only have in my head Mario Bros, because it's the only thing I see in the titles, right? but there are plenty of games, and he enters when you are playing in three rooms at the same time, and you pay $10 more per year for the subscription because the, what is happening with Mario Bros in three rooms at the same time is coming from the superposition of qubits and entanglement in real time. You know, I have made a poll among all the teenagers around me. Everybody would pay just for knowing that they are interacting with a quantum computer with two or three qubits. So, so from that point of view, some people, um, of course, this looks not serious for an academic and for the, as Thomas said, for the investors that are looking for changing the society and solving the global warming, which is almost ridiculous for, for the level of quantum computing today, but that's what is happening. That's why the quantum winter will come very soon, <laughs> because the people are lying bluntly, right? But if you are just pretty honest and said, guys, I'm providing you with collapse of wave functions in real time for your gain, you know, people pay for fantasy. People don't pay necessarily for useful things. And if you think that um, that fantasy is not making business, wait for the next week for the World Cup, <laughs> and you will see what I mean. You know, who needs football? You know, formally for for living, for surviving, almost nobody. But everybody would burn their salary and their savings to buy the new television with a, a resolution that nobody needs to see Neymar making. A goal, right? And that's 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 what what is it? And I think the few qubit creativity for the sake of fantasy, arts, exhibition, education, taking these small qubits to the schools, making children play with it, is an interesting business that we are also exploring. But but as I said, market decides. Huh? That's what Thomas was saying. It's not. I'm just telling you what I think, right? But then the market decides, and the investors, as he said, is not are not joking. You know, they are there for the money. And honestly, sometimes I don't understand why they invest based on, I solve global warming, I solved, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's a, the, the companies that are, in, that are receiving these millions are, are enjoying five qubits and they are solving the energy. I don't understand that. But, but, but let us see in two, three, or the cycle of four years of the investors, 
to see whether, the, because the idea of the investors is I invest, I put, I get a factor of four or five, then I retire my money. If the, if the quantum winter arrive, I don't care. I recover my money, right? But we do care, and, and that's why the, what I, the responsibility also of entrepreneurs and, and academic people to take this pretty seriously. Of course, to accept challenges, we fail, but with a vision that is more down to the earth and not only hyping. No? That's more or less what I mean. Well, uh, I have now a question. So we have addressed the hype. So ba hype is bad. We have addressed the investors. Investors are here with us for three years. It's a very short marriage. But now you all three have a startup. So w w can you tell us what is your target group? And I mean, it's also maybe a little bit hard to navigate now the market because we have a, you said, uh, Kike, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of things that people say, oh, quantum computer can do. And you then also need to meet the investors. You need to meet the, the, the money givers from the government and tell them about your business model and what you're going to do. So how do you swim in these waters? So in our case, we, I think we had it maybe a little bit easier because we had traps in Innsbruck. And, and stuff around it. And repetitively, we've been asked, like, can you build a trap for me? And then we said, like, can we sell it? No, the university can't sell it. And at and the end, we said, OK, can we make a business model? And then you see it's in principle, it might work. But uh, you need to have something long term. It's not just a trap. It needs to be more. And then it, essentially for us, it was this idea, vision that we can build a device. It can work. It can go onto the cloud. But at the end, it was also like, for me, at least, what we pursue at the moment is really, can we something that ideally lasts forever? It's not something which I want, at least for me, I don't want to build something which is like three, four, five years, and then I sell it off to IBM. But something where I can say, we built something that is viable, which can grow, where I can say, people in the vicinity of, let's say, our current headquarters, there is a vision for good students to say, I don't have to go to the US. I don't have to go to China. I can do something at the end of my PhD, go into industry, have an interesting job doing something which I like to do. That's why I did a PhD on it. I didn't do a physics PhD to then be in a bank. And this, this is something which, which, which where I say, if, if we manage to make the system grow, or like the, the, the business grow in such a way that we can grow and sustain it, and really with this vision of, of staying and not just growing for the sake of growth. And then you suddenly, similar to this, this um, Web 2.0 bubble, Web.com bubble, um, once you go into a winter cell, you have to let people go. Because look what's currently happen happening. Twitter sends out people. Um, uh, what's it called? Facebook is firing 10,000 people. It's like every larger com Amazon is firing people. It's like I'd rather be a little bit on the slower side and steady side, and I can say, if you stay with us and if you are with us, it's, if possible, you will be here for a lo long of time. Because in return, it means our customers ideally will know, well, if that's their wish, I might also get the long-term support and not that the company is gone in two years and suddenly no one will help me with their products anymore because no one's around. Um, yeah, so uh, startup. This uh, is with uh, Askeri. So uh, our idea was the following: like, uh, might be uh, surprising to some of you, but like the banking system in Brazil is quite uh, modern. It's like among the most modern in the world, and they are like uh, perhaps the first or second sector that invest more in uh, technology in Brazil. And of course, they have a lot of money. So we thought, well, there might be some good opportunity there if we focus on the uh, financial market uh, to develop perhaps something. I mean, we are not going to do hardware. We are going to use like the existing noisy hardware or like maybe uh, quantum-based like classical algorithms uh, to try to solve uh, real problems that these people care and that if you like improve a 0 0.05, this means maybe uh, two billion dollars, right? So I mean, even like very small like advantages, they can be uh, enough to mean something. And then we started the startup, but I mean, of course we had no idea of like um, how to 
uh, proceed and we still don't, but uh, what we are trying right now, and I must say this is not really working, is that we are talking to like uh, big companies, but my impression is that they are basically like listening to us, uh, getting the basic ideas, and they never call us back, and then they uh, submit a grant of like 10 million to, to the government, they get it, and we are out of business. So this is what's, it's what's happening. Like they are really uh, smart and sometimes evil, so you, you need to take care. Uh, but that's it, like uh, we don't have these like uh, business experience, but uh, we are really suffering like to- and, and good lawyers. And well, Asked is a lawyer too, so we actually have a, he's a quantum scientist and lawyer, so this is a good- uh, Very important lawyer. in this business. But yeah, so so we our model like changed the lot, and one thing that uh, is perhaps the first thing that it's going to work, uh, it's like uh, what many people call quantum um, awareness. That it's this idea of like scientists trying to explain to the general public, like in the best possible terms, what means like quantum computation, how they can apply it, and this is something that like we hope next year there is some sort of big project coming out that it's this like uh, we as uh, scientists explaining like people that work with uh, the financial market and like uh, classical uh, 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 scientists like uh, uh, computer scientists how to use uh, quantum concepts and algorithms in their uh, in their applications so but yeah we are basically out of business okay Interesting. So essentially, I, I created, um, as I said, Quambi, I explained before, it's just a challenge to say, do few qubits in the hardware can, using creativity, make products that, that attract uh, investors and, and customers? And um, in, in that vision, there is also the, the interest I have always had also because of family reasons come from, from family of school. Uh, uh, school teachers and, and, and education that I, I uh, uh, also my family is related to also schools, kindergarten, children, and I have been going to schools every single year uh, to explain quantum computing to children of eight, 10 years old. And my experience is quite, quite positive and successful, I would say. Um, and then I was focused on, on the possibility of bringing the um, qubits to the people, you know, to like democratization of the of the quantum uh, and 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 I do believe that it's not the same like many colleagues told me that oh if you can use a simulator why you need to send the qubits you know it's the same reason why when you want to drink an orange juice you don't drink it via YouTube and you drink it really right and when you do physics labs in the school or chemistry labs you you don't just check a video you do it yourself and and education is done by the in direct interaction with with the, with the with the stuff, right? Uh, so that's one side. Uh, and the, on the side of Kipu Quantum, it was just a, a personal challenge for me. I, I have been very bored. I have been very successful in my academic career, and this bores me deeply. You know, success is pretty boring. To publish Nature, Physical Review Letters, I have published too many. Um, I have plenty of ideas. You know, I have like 200 amazing projects in science that I just don't have time to develop. And suddenly, I saw that we lost the track of the quantum computing and the quantum technologies to the industrial um, community. And that's, that, that all, um, I was not happy at all. You know, We were losing some influence. Somehow big companies, big corporates, big investments, investors took that uh, with a lot of non-academic arguments and I was always uh, disappointed. So I, I'm a person that uh, likes challenges and I said, okay, what about jumping there and and trying to do something meaningful. And, and as, as, as you heard yesterday, the only reason why I am open Kipu Quantum is because I think that we have ideas and we will have even better ideas to approach quantum advantage to our present life. Um, the day in which I will realize that I failed on that, I will do something else. I, I don't plan to stay here just raising money and making hype and announcing things. I, I, I don't need it. I think that it's a question of pride also. People that have creativity and ideas should be proud of that, but also should accept um, when, when things don't work. So, so somehow you see I'm, I'm kind of 
pretty polarized here because Quambia is trying to say there is a market and there is a product in the few qubits. Uh, and, 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 and the other company, Kipu Quantum, is, is saying, guys, let us go for the maximal number of qubits, noisy, dirty, as the way you want, and whether there is a hope there to make a, a, a highlight uh, of quantum advantage. So that's more or less the, the way I do it, but I share also the views of Thomas, and I was very moved by the comments, by the way, of Rafael and Thomas, and I, 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 I share their frustration in the sense that, for example, I, we have, of course, co-founders, right? But I personally didn't create my companies to raise money, you know, to, to, to go uh, public and to sell it to another company. No, no, the idea is to, to bring talent, you know, people that accept challenges. And there is also something very personal that when I was a young researcher, I was frustrated because I was very jealous of the first 30 years of the 20th century because I, I, I read a lot of history and science when I was young. Um, and, and I was very, very jealous how you know, people propose ideas, most of them wrong, you know, to model the atom, relativity. And I like this, this pool of creative discussions. And, uh, and I said, now science is getting very, very certain, not so novel. I like a lot, and I think I, I said it yesterday or not, but I repeat it to finish, and it's the fact that in quantum computing, you can say anything that looks deep, and if you say the opposite, you have 100 brilliant people that support one idea and 100 brilliant people that support the opposite. You know? So it's a, it's a place where there is a lot to bet, and a lot, you, you risk a lot. And this sense, this adrenaline of the risk is, uh, for me, very, very appealing. Uh, and I like to be there. Of course, I want to win, <laughs> right? But, uh, but there is a possibility that we lose, and, and that's something that attracts me a lot. And I think young people and researchers like also some challenges like that. Hi, hello. Yes. So, um, um, well, I just wanted to ask, actually, like, um, 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 well, about like comparison between, like, uh, well, because, like, 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 I'm very interested into, uh, 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 like, like fundamental physics. Let's say, well, well, like, like, like high energy physics, actually. And um, um, well, I used to work with uh, with. Uh, well, some people here working on um, um, on on QCD, but then I just got like 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 really really interested into like a uh, like 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 quantum information, and I have uh, well I have discovered this interesting field of well quantum simulations of lattice gauge theories. Amazing, right? So you can join both things, but actually like like I would like to know from uh, from uh, from 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 all of you actually like uh, like like how do you see that uh, that like 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 uh, well how does it compare nowadays like uh, like like lattice QCD made in the in the classical computers and so on with uh, with the state that we are using our quantum devices like do you think that we will have some sort of new discovery coming from these quantum devices in like I don't know ten years or something like like I just wanted to know if uh, like like. Like, well, am I really working on the lattice QCD of the future? Like, that's what I want to know. Like, because that's what I wanted to do when I first started working on that. So I'll start because I have an easy start and then I'll leave the hard part to you. Uh, so we did lattice surgery simulations with a Trotter approach of high energy physics um, for lattice, search, uh, lattice simulations. It essentially was um, vacuum uh, particle antiparticle splitting. Which, which when I did it with Peter, Peter Zoller was really, really happy. And, and then I said the wrong thing because I told him these were like the, the most challenging rubby flops we ever did. Because essentially you're changing to between vacuum and having a particle-antiparticle pair. So from a physics point of view, it's just two states which you couple to. And if the energy matches, it's like nice, and you get rubby flops that go to one. And if it's mismatched, then it's smaller, and the excitation probability goes down. Everything as you would expect from rubby flops. A pain in the neck in the lab. That took us weeks to get it working and so on, and calibrate it and so on. And at the end, there was very little that we initially thought we would learn. But what was interesting to hear from us in the other way around was, well, from a physics point of view, it's like, as expected, yes, there is entanglement and so on. And it's essentially impossible for CERN to do the measurements that we are familiar with in quantum information. So it's like, if you have this particle, antiparticle, are they entangled, yes or no? It's like, like 
well, if you describe everything with quantum chromodynamics, quantum mechanics, it should be entangled. It has to be. There's like a strong correlation, and if there's no decoherence, it has to be coherent, so it's probably entangled. And these are properties we can check with quantum simulators. Uh, but then I'm also experimentalist at the end of the day, so it's like as much as I might simulate in my quantum simulator, at the end, CERN should show it in real life as well. But at least to give me indications of what I need to look at, which parameter range is promising, and which one is likely a waste of time, this is something where simulators can be very valuable. And, and so maybe it's that we use the quantum simulators, quantum devices, whatever they might be in the long run, to at least help us to know what to look at, even if you don't trust them entirely. But at least they give you is like, okay, this is a good parameter range, this is something you might ignore. And, and ideally it helps you to, to narrow down some of your search parameters. Um, so I did uh, in my master like uh, high energy physics, but I realized it like soon ago that I actually don't know what I did in my master <laughs> until now. So I should be the right person to uh, answer your question, but uh, I'm not. But the, so like just uh, complementing from this experimental uh, side, I think this is a very uh, important question because like if you are talking about quantum systems, as you said, like uh, there should be entanglement there. And if you try to simulate those effects, in a classical computer, you just can't. I mean, unless you are talking about very uh, particular uh, class of states that can be uh, s simulated classically. So like running on a classical computer, most likely you are losing something. You are really like uh, they're going to see because you are using a classical machine. So yeah, it's like something that I think it could be very important in the future. I don't know when. So this is from the experimental side, like this quantum, um, simulations, but from the purely uh, theoretical and conceptual side. Quantum information has changed many things. Like, uh, I mean, you have this uh, information uh, paradox that it's like this mismatch or this apparent uh, mismatch between like um, these um, black hole uh, uh, evaporation and like the unitarity of, uh, of quantum mechanics. So, I mean, of course you have to talk about quantum information to actually try to solve it. Or you have like th these things as like uh, ER equal to EPR. Uh, I, I have, I tried to read the paper. I didn't understand anything, but I mean, I think I at least have some ideas w of what this means. Or like these uh, works of people like talking about uh, the um, emergence of space time as some sort of like entanglement or like uh, the space time is some sort of quantum error uh, correcting code. And I, there are many other examples, like uh, uh, two years ago or three years ago, like someone asked, no, couldn't it be that this bump that we are seeing in some CERN uh, data couldn't be due to entanglement? I mean, as far as I know, like uh, high energy physicists only uh, recently started like uh, uh, talking about entanglement. It, it's something that it, it's, it's at the core of quantum mechanics and like uh, people doing high energy physics like only recently started to using that uh, concept in, the, in, in their research. So yeah, I think like uh, entanglement qu uh, qu or I mean like find, uh, foundational stuff like uh, Bell's theorem or like uh, Wigner's friends, uh, paradox and these sort of things. Like uh, this could be very useful for this um, uh, foundational research in many areas of uh, physics. Uh, so yeah, I think there you like quantum information is having and will have a very big impact in all these areas of uh, physics. So okay, so uh, that's a very um, it touches my my brain, my soul, and my heart. This question because I have worked a lot in quantum simulation, and I had made plenty of uh, reflection, self-criticism, and criticism to the, to the, to the field. So I, I, I will try to be very concise, but I can speak hours for, from this topic. Uh, for example, I was shocked when somebody told me, quantum simulation, it is not something like one equal to one, worse, one equal to 0 0.9. You know, so are you just doing things that we already know? And that's something that really uh, was very aggressive. Uh, to my work and to the work of many. So if, if just simulating things, it's just copying the same thing, trying to do the same thing, right? And in the case of uh, quantum simulation in particular, 
uh, that I develop a lot, uh, theoretically, and with a lot of experimental success also, I was constantly confronted to that, to that uh, problem. And, um, and then there were also very important uh, uh, questions in those times. This had a peak like, like 10 years ago. And, um, and for example, one of the interesting issues was, um, if you are making a quantum simulation, will you be able to discover something new? because you are just simulating the same model. And if you simulate the same model, the same model cannot produce something new, like creating a new model, in, in particular in relation to high energy physics, for example, right? So if you are simulating a QCD model, can you predict something that goes out of that model, or it is just bounded by this uh, imitation, right? So it's a very, very interesting topic, and I solve it um, uh, myself, uh, and I, I wrote it in some of my papers, many reflections. Uh, uh, um, and, and I, I, I cannot develop too much, but I relate it to the whole history of, of, of arts and creativity and math. So I, I concluded that everything that we had done is a simulation, <laughs> literally. Even mathematics uh, was becoming a simulation for me, physics and so on. But, but just to, to wrap up something meaningful for you, um, um, I discovered many things that are written in my papers, but I wanted to share only one with you. Uh, that was very deep and justified my efforts and the efforts of the community is that quantum simulation is just observing um, uh, physical systems that have a certain quantum behavior, extracting the model. Every model is always partial. No? A model is never perfect. That's a typical mistake of, of, of people, many experts included. So you observe a system and you extract partial information and you model it. And then you test it and you conclude that in a certain parameter range it, it is correct. Now you take that model that is abstract, you know, and you try to implement it and to reproduce it in another system. And this will also be partial and imperfect and so on. So what's the point of trying to extract a model from one side and put it in another? First of all, just for fun. And I always defended that, just because I want. That's important. But relevant is when, when I discover that every time that you do that, that you impose an artificial system taking from A into B, B has different properties, and by failing in mapping that, not in the perfect imitation, but in the failure of, of, the, of the effort to imitate, new physics emerge. And I have published plenty of papers, published in the best journals, with that principle. So, so I tried to imitate, and by failing in the imitation, I created novel physics. And to keep it as a reflection, because that's what happened in the history of arts also. In the history of, of art, many, many, many people try to imitate things, imitate landscape, imitate colors, imitate figures, you know, and, and, uh, and the, the big uh, advances in art happen when, when we said, guys, we are failing, we cannot make things are perfect. And I concluded that imitation from a philosophical point of view and a scientific point of view is always failing. And I put it in somewhere, probably in Twitter, that the, the way the human being has processed the frustration in failing to make a perfect imitation is the origin of creativity. So keep it for you and just be creative with the failure of the constant imitation in quantum simulation and, and you will be happier. Uh, I have one, thank you. Um, so I, I have one, one question for, for, for Thomas here because you have a hardware company. So Kike said qubits to the people. So hardware versus cloud. How do you see with the companies that would rather like to have access via cloud or companies that would rather like to? Cubits to the people. So I assume that. <laughs> Don't confuse me, Kiki. I mean, by, by, I mean, by six, you're going to have already a dance here for it, I guess. So, um, <laughs> okay, so the next step is going to be Qubit Samba, I can see that. Uh, so, um, Tommy, cloud versus selling a machine? For, for, which, what, go, for which goal? <laughs> yeah, so what kind of customers are rather interested in cloud access and what kind of customers are interested in having um, machine at their site? Those companies that want to make sure that they have an embargo on what they do, they don't want to share the code with anyone. Like, like think about, let's take a simple example. You are, let's say, buyer, Bosch, some, 
and you do some chemistry problem, some new alloy which might help with batteries or so, and you want to make sure that you, you solve this problem, you see something, you know this takes me 10 years and longer. And, and, and when I work on it, I, I don't want anyone to know, neither what I work on, nor which approach I use, nor anything else. These are usually the people then have their own computers on site to really make sure that no data actually ever leaves the ground. Um, these are the ones which are interested in getting systems, whether that's now quantum or classical, it doesn't matter. It has to be on site. And you get your chip and you have your USB dongle, something that really your laptop and only you get access. But the systems are not there yet to really do that. The next branch of people that are interested in getting a system is now um, those that say, okay, we, we can do it because we don't have to do it for commercial considerations. We don't have to do something for 10 years and not talk about it. You could say, I am take Hulich or any of the six others that now in the Euro HPC in Europe are meant to get quantum computers. Whereas like you have a quantum computer and often it's described as, as an accelerator. It, it, at least it's, and the quantum computer is not helping you to watch YouTube. It's not helping you to write an email. But as Eduardo was showing, there are some algorithms in the background where it's notably more efficient. And you could say, if I want to write a library and it, it's, let's say, quantum aware, it notices, ah, there is some code, there is some Fourier transform. This one works better in a quantum computer than in a classical one. Can I somehow send that piece of code now to the quantum accelerator? or for other use cases, you need a graphics card or a CPU. Like to, to figure out how to do it, when to do it, this is something that's currently pursued by high performance computing centers to really say how can we do this heterogeneous computing infrastructure um, with higher levels of abstraction with the goal being there is a, a computer scientist, there is a math person, um, he wants to use the system but he doesn't want to learn quantum mechanics. At the end, it's, it's like, I don't know, I don't care, is it an Intel chip, is it an AMD, whatever my, like the laptop, at the end, Word and Excel and, and LaTeX needs to work. Um, and so for the math guy, it's the same thing. He wants to have his stuff faster, with less errors, more efficiently. And that's something where the HPC people are interested to do it locally and fast, and then there seems to be this big gap, because then it's a question of costs. And now if, if, if Kike wants to, to play around with different devices and say, I want to, because you are locked in, the very moment you bought this laptop, you have this laptop and not a Mac and not something else. Whereas, but Kike says, I want to work with photons today and next week I want to do neutral atoms and you week afterwards and V and then ions. And that's way easier via the cloud. And that also is in terms of being locked in, that's why these decisions are really hard because there's so much progress by the time you buy the system and get it installed, it's outdated again. Um, and so it's easier to say, I just take a step back and I just, I just let it be maintained on the cloud and if you don't satisfy me, um, then I move to the next vendor. And so I think if someone wants to jump around, play around, try different things, then the cloud is easier and my gut feeling and it's also the way we experienced, it's like we have partners, contacts, whatever, that simply say, I want to have access for one project, it's going to be done three, four days, um, and then, then we don't know whether we return or not. And so for those people, obviously cloud access is way, way nicer than saying I have to buy it and then, yeah, and then you have it. Hello, okay. So I have uh, somewhat of a two-folded question, uh, and it is mostly about costs, right? So um, I was hearing from an expert the other day that the invention of the integrated circuit uh, made the cost of building chips and fabric manufacturing chips uh, at about 1,000 times uh, lower than it was before that. So. I would like to ask you uh, if there is, if do you think there is something, some invention of this sort that is possible in quantum computation? 
And if you think that there is, maybe what is it? Or at least, where should we be for it? Uh, okay, that's my question. I think Tom should reply that. <laughs> anyway, I, just, just that he's not uh, angry with me. Um, yeah, it's very interesting, your question. Um, I, I find it like a, like a loop holder uh, because if you manufacture many chips and it makes them cheaper, I mean, uh, I mean, the goal was not to make chips cheaper, right? <laughs> The goal was to make computers. And then because computers were useful, then people said, let us make more. And that's the reason why chips, you know, so, 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 so that's a loop. And an interesting thing that I want to ask Tom now, related to your question, is that I have heard, because I'm also now in this entrepreneurial activity, many people trying to associate cost per qubit. You know? <laughs> it's an interesting concept, and I, I'm sure Tom will tell you more, but uh, cost per qubit superconductor, photon, and so on. I don't know how real is it, but it's a valid, a valid topic, and people are estimating. So I think initially this question was a lot motivated by the superconducting people, because they had to have one RF oscillator per qubit. And this one good RF source was like 30, 40, 50K. And if you then had 100 qubits, then your RF is quite uh, expensive. Um, and then they tried to look how to make it cheaper. And there was a, oh, that was like four years, five years ago, there was an IALPA workshop um, where we, we managed to convince them to talk about enabling technologies to really say, look, actually, can we use some friendly standardization to reduce costs? Because currently, one of the problems is yeah, you have 25 solutions and everyone everyone develops on his or her own. And that means you have 25 the development costs rather than one person doing a good job. Um, and so in principle, we could, given underlying physics, but in principle, we could use with ions the very much same RF electronics as IBM is using. And the same applies to most of the other entities because you do frequency modulation of a carrier signal. And whether that carrier is now gigahertz or optical doesn't really matter. And so that might be a way of lowering the costs because we say, we, let's see, we all agree to do something which are, is like an open standard. And that this works actually has been demonstrated to a large degree by the ion community. So if you look it up, there is a hard, open hardware solution which is called Sinara. And this was developed and jointly developed by, by NIST, by Oxford, by Hanover, by, by Maryland, by ARL. Um, we are now joining, let's say, putting our effort there as well. And to give you a feeling, it's the, the complete control electronics for a full-blown ion trap quantum computer as we use them at the University of Innsbruck. It's about 25K. And it used to be like 100K in 2005 to 2010. Yeah, 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 dollar, euro. Today it doesn't same. matter. Mm. Um, and, and so that, at least for us, the, the, the control electronics went down by a factor of four or five. Uh, one problem for us, the lasers are as expensive as ever. Um, and so I paid 30K for a laser 15 years ago and still pay 30K. Um, there is obviously some room for improvement, but the currently I fear that the costs will actually go up. Because everyone raise your hand who still has a CD player. <laughs> and you see CD players, the red diets initially were coming from CD players. No one cared about the academics. The blue diets that we have for photonization that we heard about today, for instance, the blue were actually Blu-ray diets. These were like the offshots which were not operating at 405. They were operating at 422. We got those cheap leftover diets. Who has a Blu-ray DVD player? No one anymore. It's, it's really a question whether this academic demand can sustain the infrastructure. Maybe, maybe the cost for some stuff actually goes up because lots of the enabling technologies that we were using were never ever meant to be ours. It's, it's, it's again, this experimental physicist approach. There is something which is good enough, I use it. Uh, but it could be that some of the costs go up. And also chips, you could say it's getting cheaper, but that's not true. 
because if you look at the current chip prices going up, a lot of that is actually due to old hardware where the, where the infrastructure was depreciated, so it was paid 20 years ago. You didn't have to pay anything anymore, it was paid off, and now they have to buy new devices. And these new good devices from ASML and Zeiss and so on, this is why now they suddenly see a pike of, oh, I have to invest a billion for the new machine, then they say, oh, where did these costs come from? Yeah, we have to add that on the old chip prices. And that's why currently these, these costs of new chips built on new infrastructure actually also going up and not down anymore. But yeah, cost, cost per qubit, I think that's the, the, the biggest challenge because, yeah, it's, it's again bringing us to linear. It's like if, if the costs are linear growing with the number of qubits, you have a problem. Yeah, I, I just want to add something from uh, the theory side. Like, uh, well, we have different. Uh, uh, what? Cost per Hamiltonian. Cost per Hamiltonian. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, different uh, platforms, like uh, superconducting uh, qubits. Then you have like uh, photonics or ion traps, and so you have many. We don't know which one will be more scalable, uh, cheaper. But I, I also want to bring to the discussion the fact that we have different uh, models of uh, quantum computation. And here, like like most people are uh, focusing on this circuit uh, model, but you also have the adiabatic uh, model, then you have this measurement-based uh, model that, for me as a theorist, it seems very uh, uh, promising because you basically get all the hard part that is the entanglement, like in the beginning, and then doing easy things, I mean, that is just like locally measuring, so I'm talking as a theoretician, okay? <laughs> just uh, locally measuring, you can run your uh, computation. And so, I mean, if there is a big surprise, I would say, it's going to come from a different model uh, of uh, quantum computation, like a breakthrough. Uh, and we cannot forget about uh, topological quantum computing. That still doesn't exist, but if somehow this happens, this could be a game changer as well, so we also might consider different models of quantum computation. Uh, thank you so much. I, I just have to add recently, I was, a, if I may say something, I was at a conference, it was purely theory talks, and in the last talk, the theorist said that this is very easy, it's only 200 qubits. You can imagine how much I laugh. I mean, you, you could never say that the experimentalists can have so much fun in a theory talk. We have one online question. Yes, uh, there is a question from YouTube audience here. Uh, Mario Haya Neto is asking about, uh, there, there exists any prospect to merge numerical relativity pro problems and quantum computation? Numerical relativity problems. I guess he's asking about something about Dirac equation, perhaps. <laughs> so you are the guy. Thanks a, lot. Thanks a lot, but anyway, this is uh, the, the experiment happened in Innsbruck. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we did the Dirac equation a time ago. Um, um, I mean, and quantum computation. I come back to the topic of the lady, I don't know her name, but that, sorry? Barbara. Barbara. Okay, Barbara. And I just relate to that because, I mean, just to, to say something meaningful. Um, um, when we proposed in a physical review letter 2007 that you can simulate in a trapped ion the Dirac equation, right, it was not meant to overcome any computational difficulty. And in fact, uh, with Rainer and the Innsbruck team, we discussed a lot what for, why, what is the point, you know. And there are many, many sides. Uh, and I, I think that, that what you are getting from this round table is that questions are, look very deep, but uh, you know, depends on the customer and, 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 and the, the, the application and the end user and the use case and the goals and the funding. It really has different phases. And in that case, the only fun I had when I convinced Christian Ross and the, and the Innsbruck team is that, look, the trapped ion if you check the speed, you know, it's not relativistic speed. However, you can send lasers and make it behave like if it were relativistic. 
and uh, that was fun for me and for, for the Innsbruck team. But uh, I, I, I accepted when people raised their hand and said, yeah, but I can simulate that with my laptop. What sh why shall I do it in the, in the, in the experiment? And, and, and I was telling what I said before, yesterday, right? because physics happens in the lab. You know? It's not uh, on my paper. It's not a calculation. Physics happens in the lab. So to make that a non-relativistic particle behaves like a relativistic one was just cute, you know, was, was elegant. That you can look at the way I say it, how to encode a relativistic behavior in a non-relativistic object. That's beautiful, right? But then came many, many things, and I discovered that the Dirac equation, I think in the super relativistic limit, was behaving like the quantum Rabi model. That is the origin of the uh, dipolar light matter coupling since, since the 20s and the 30s of the last century. And then you start to play with that, and you, know, and you never end. Then I discovered the deep strong coupling regime of light matter interaction. It was because of the Dirac equation. You know? so, so I think that people overlook the fact that imitating you know, with, with a quantum system, uh, another one, uh, at the beginning looks, it could look very simple, but if you are creative enough, associating, I call them the communication vessels. You know, you communicate the relativity community <laughs> with the optical, quantum optics community and fi anatomic physics, and that's, that's deep. Then, of course, we were th thinking how this can be raised to answer the question, you know, to, to computational complexity. Then we move to, 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 to um, quantum electrodynamics. You know? so, so you see, you start by very, very simple things, looking for small analogies, and then you, if you develop, you can reach the point where we had a, a physical regulator 2015, I remember, where we made the first proposal well beyond uh, John Preskill on how to simulate quantum field theories in trapped ions, in superconductors, and so on. So that's, um, that's uh, what I suggest, you know. That's, that's the academic spirit no? and the creativity of people. And uh, I insist that simulations, as banal as they may look, they are very deep if you know how to distort it towards something new. Anyway, so that's... Thank you. Uh, when we see news about quantum computing and quantum technologies, it, they are usually a focus on the Western world. By that I mean Europe and North America. Uh, what interesting developments do you, do, we, do you observe coming from South America, Africa, or Eastern Asia? Well, very good. I take this very personally, and I think I was sharing my views with some students here, some younger people. You know, I was born in Peru. Right? This belongs to South America and this belongs to Latin America. But when people ask me where I come from, I always ask, you know, I come from the Big Bang, and you? Right? I, I, that, that's my origin, the Big Bang. And from that point of view, when I was studying physics in Peru, and most engineers and people said, yeah, but with atomic physics and quantum optics and quantum computing, do you help uh, children that are poor to eat something every day, you know? And that was destroying my, my, my ethics. And I solved this uh, several decades ago when I realized that I just come from the Big Bang. And it doesn't matter where I was born if I feel that I can change the history of humankind that the intellectual, artistic, technological, and entrepreneurial point of, point of view, I can do it. Now, being more focused on your question, uh, of course, people say, OK, you, so you are free to do whatever you want. Yes, that's what we are all doing, right? And what should all be able to do. But the question is whether, whether at the end you can even help children to eat, right? And my answer is absolutely yes. You know, and I, I, I just give you one example that I used to give because it sounds weird, right? Imagine that you develop a quantum algorithm that solves a logistic problem in the subway of Shanghai in China. People say, come on, are you helping the poor children in Rio de Janeiro that are living in the streets? You know, if you do that in Rio de Janeiro or in Sao Paulo, and you are able to make your patent, and then you sell it to the Shanghai government, where I have worked some years, you know, and you import some millions of dollars and euros, children in Rio de Janeiro can eat also. You, know? you create jobs, you create a, a community, a network. So it is very, very blind if you just think that uh, the only way to help the society and the place where we, one has, born, has been born is just by you know, taking bread and giving it to the children. Life is not that easy, and societies are not that simple. So by just developing at the highest level uh, uh, the intellect, the business, the economy, the science, and the technology, if one is smart enough, we can also end up by pleasing our in inner demons and souls and also helping um, our, our, our societies locally. So that's the way I see it. So yes, I am helping children in Peru to eat. 
by making quantum computing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think this is a very important question. Um, so let me start with uh, an example, like the pandemics of uh, COVID. In a, in a few months, like in a year, I don't know how long we had the uh, vaccine, because it was like a worldwide uh, effort, like everyone was affected by that, and they were like trying as fast as possible to get rid of that. But I mean, we have diseases that don't affect the rich uh, countries and that they still don't have a vaccine, they are not well studied, I don't know, dengue, uh, malaria. So with quantum computing, it could be something similar. I mean, we are talking about like optimizing the uh, gains of a bank or like uh, helping Google deliver uh, faster their searchers or like uh, Amazon to uh, have better routes and uh, save money or uh, whatever, but we have a lot of uh, applications. And applications depend uh, from, where the, from where they come from. Like the things that South America or Africa or other uh, countries need might be different and they are different from what Europe and North America need. So if we have such a powerful uh, computing machine that can be used in many applications, but they are only used to make money, this will increase uh, the social inequality and, po and uh, poverty as a whole. So, I mean, this is something that we should think uh, seriously, that uh, if these machines will ever exist, we should have one of them in Africa, one in South America, to like uh, people there thinking about their local uh, problems, being able to also uh, get any benefits out of there. So, I think this is very important, and of course, no one is thinking about that, right? Like. Uh, if you think about quantum computation, yeah, let's make more money. That's the, that's the, what most people uh, would think, right? So yeah, it's very important. So it's good that you brought that. Would like to hear the opinion of Tom that has a very poor country. <laughs> so I come from maybe not poor, but small. <laughs> Compared to Brazil, I think it's, no. <laughs> Um, I think there are two aspects to the question. One is like flow of information in general. So it's like if you think about your university making a nature paper, and if you make a press release, no matter what you do, it's not going to be as great as if Zuckerberg makes a fart. It's, it's, it's that the bottom line. It's like some news just get amplified beyond all reasonable measures. Um, and something which you think this is really a great thing. We got it into nature, we got a certain award and so on. Uh, and, and you are struggling to get it into the local news, even less so internationally recognized. But at the end, it's about who clicks on it. And yes, more people click on any news from Google, Twitter, Facebook, something. Um, then, then other news, and, and I find it always very interesting. I have contacts in China, in Russia, in the UK. Uh, when, when Brexit happened, uh, to, to talk with my colleagues in the UK how much the, the announcement, the press, the news was different in the UK compared to what was communicated in Europe. Um, so so there, there is a reason why things get communicated the way they, the way they get communicated, um, and there is just more visibility to let's say, Northern America and a little bit on Europe. But if you think about quantum, I, I was, about a year ago, I was asked to give a presentation at the European Commission in terms of achievements in quantum technologies. And, and I had some graphs showing, again, GHZ states and, and which platform did what. And then I did one nasty thing, because then I asked them, so like, so where do you think these achievements have been made? And they were like, yeah, yeah, clear, superconducting, that was that's for sure somewhere in America. It's like, no, no, that was China, Chen Waiban. And then it was like, photonics, isn't that uh, Jeremy O'Brien in the US? And it's like, no, no, it was again, Chen Waiban in China. And we went through that list, and essentially there was one European flag, there was one American flag, and I think there were three or four Chinese flags which for whatever reasons are not that well communicated, recognized. Um, but that brings us back to the academic community where we can at least openly admit, because it's like we are on friendly terms, always a little bit jointly competing, pushing ourselves. 
uh, pushing ourselves with colleagues working in the same field, not necessarily that way, but more like you have a solution, tell me, can I learn how you fixed it? Um, to then also communicate to the others, look, we are not the best in this and this field. It's this area is better, this area is better. And I can just tell you from, from everything I know and hear, it's like we have had wonderful theorists coming from South America to Innsbruck, where I say, okay, maybe it's, it's like you, you, you adapt. I mean, that's something great as humans. We adapt to the circumstances that we have. If you don't have the money to build expensive devices, you have great brain power to at least bring up great new ideas. And I think at least from the people that I know, if you have a good idea, I know essentially no experimental group which is not happily willing to listen to you to figure out whether such an idea can be implemented. And so, so in that sense, yeah, you, some areas might not have the visibility, but it doesn't mean that you can't strive and get something cool going. Um, hi, um, maybe complementing that question, and maybe for Kiki and Thomas. So, as you just said, like Brazil, Brazil's role in this quantum information right now seems to be exporting people, like uh, from from here to Europe to UA to China and so on. But to have supremacy, <laughs> and also we are, we are shipping back postdocs <laughs> from Innsbruck to <laughs> Brazil. Yes, but uh, my role in, in academia, it seems like to be uh, generating more engineer, more quantum engineers that will leak from the country and so on. How do you think that we can make, like, and how long would it take to make a, a step for Brazil to, to get like a, a role play in this game? Like, do you think? Uh, These are persons, figure out what persons want. It's like I can tell you from Innsbruck, it's like we by far have no means of offering salaries like Silicon Valley. But I have people in my team which come there because they have little kids and they know they can leave the university ground. There is a little stream over there, you know, Kranewitten. Um, and they can go there with the little ones and they can play at the stream. They can make a fire to grill some sausages and they can drink the water from the stream without getting sick. And they say, this is something they can't do in Stuttgart, this is something they can't do in many other areas, and they are willing to earn a little less money, but they have a family where the kids go outside and play in the forest for an entire weekend, and they just come back home covered in dirt with a big smile on their face. And that's what they really care about at some point. And it's not just the Silicon Valley salary. So if you, I think if you can offer something where people can be happy, and obviously, some like being able to, to sustain what you want, but it's like first and foremost make them happy. And it's not like if it's money that's the only thing that makes them happy, as Kike said, it's like it's not money which sometimes makes us move and makes us happy. It's, it's never been your salary in Innsbruck which, which made us sit in the lab until one o'clock in the morning. It's because we did something cool and we achieved something, and that's why we did it. And I think if we, if we manage to have an environment where that's get, let's say, reasonably well awarded, um, you, you can get people back. At least that's my opinion, because I see it in terms of, in the European landscape, we are by far not the best paying persons, but we have other bonuses, other things that people appreciate. And the others, it's skiing and hiking and whatever, but, but it's like you have also an interesting landscape, which, which is way too hot for me, but <laughs> others might like the hot weather. Um, yeah, so to be very short, like uh, in Natal, I'm working in Natal, in the, it's in the northeast of uh, Brazil. In the 2014 uh, World Cup, they constructed a stadium that, co that costed like, I don't know, one billion reais. And basically, so we have two teams, one is in the D League, the other is in the C League. So this stadium is basically used for concerts of uh, uh, Wesley Safadão. So, I mean, you see, like one billion you know how much it cost to send this uh, misuse uh, satellite in China, like this uh, satellite that can share like entanglement, it costed one billion reais. So we have the money, we have the people that can do that, so we just don't do it. But uh, yeah, it's a matter of uh, making the uh, right choices. And I think we started doing the right choices like not so long ago, so Maybe this will change now, instead of uh, Wesley Safadown, like a quantum satellite. 
let's hope for, for that. So we have the brains, we have the human power, we have the will. It's just a matter of like uh, better focusing the how, how we spend all this uh, money we have in Brazil. So I think it, it could happen. Yeah, just briefly, I think the question was not for me, but just to, to add um, to the discussion, um, I have nothing against the people that leave uh, South America to look for whatever they want, you know. I, I, I do believe in, in, in the individual freedom and individual life, as, as Thomas was saying. You know. I've been working in many countries, in Peru, day and night, just because I had a passion and a wish to do it. And some, sometimes, I think Thomas also mentioned it, what we overlook, and I was sharing this with some of you in private discussions, is that difficulty, you know, is the best motivation and inspiration for creativity. And sometimes we, we tend to complain too much. You know, I have learned uh, formal science in Germany, rational thinking in France, to love football and samba in Brazil, you know, to cry like the Indians in Peru, you know, but the creativity that I have comes from the overcoming difficulty in, 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 in difficult countries. So sometimes we tend to, to, fo to focus too much on, on everything that looks beautiful, free education, free that, but you know, uh, we are not here to, to complain. We have only one life and we should have to respect the people. And the more talent goes out and goes to conquer the world, the more we share it. Uh, the more people go out, the more people will come back. You know, <laughs> there are only two people that go out and succeed. It will be very hard that they come back uh, ten, right? <laughs> so, so that's that's very healthy. That's the way the way I see it. In the, see it also like uh, football. You know, the best football players in Brazil are making millions. Where they buy their houses? I mean, back here, right? So, so let us not think just in a linear manner. But things are very complex and circular. Uh, I, uh, today I was speaking with somebody from Chile, or yesterday I think, and, and I was mentioning, you know, Chile is, is very strong in astrophysics. Why? Because of just uh, geographic reasons, you know. Uh, so is, is, is this astrophysics giving food to the poor children? No, but it's bringing a lot of millions. <laughs> a lot of Chileans are around the world. A lot of foreigners come to Chile, and that's a smart way of seeing things, science and technology. And on the same time, they are making wonderful contributions to astrophysics. So, so let us try to think a little beyond the beautiful emotional sentence, and we can, we can develop uh, more things, right? So we are close to, to finishing this, this round table. So I have one question for the end. And that is, um, so many people have learned a lot new things about quantum computing in already these two days and gonna be here for two weeks. So I was wondering, since today um, nearly everyone feels entitled to write about quantum computing, would you be able to recommend some uh, media channels like blogs, like um, sites, on, some web pages on the internet where one can follow the latest development in a serious manner so that we kind of uh, do not get all the hype and we do not get all the false information. I think he knows the right word, but isn't it called this uh, quantum bullshit radar? <laughs> yes, quantum bullshit radar is there, <laughs> for sure. I think it's, it's history, no. It's, yeah, it's in Twitter. Uh, does it still exist? I think so. I'd have to check. But there was on Twitter, there was something where, where whenever there was a news release, there was a comment whether this was like completely overhyped or actually like reasonable. I have no clue, but it still exists. Yeah. But <laughs> um, well, so let me do some self-advertisement here. Like, uh, All out? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I just wrote a book of like uh, outreach book about quantum information that wow. it's out like for one month. So, I mean, if you trust me, Congratulations. You should, yeah, yeah. So it was uh, during the pandemic, nothing to do. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's write a book. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, I think like uh, a book from a scientist you, you, you can trust. So, I mean, I don't know if you should trust me, but uh, anyway. Um, and the way I'm learning most, uh, it's a bit funny, but it's uh, via LinkedIn. Like, uh, I resisted a lot to enter, and now when I want to read something, I just randomly pick like some of the uh, contacts there, and they always have something interesting to say or like some uh, 
blog or some link. So I really learn a lot uh, via LinkedIn. So just link uh, yourself to like good people that you trust and like uh, that are well known in the community and you are going to get a lot of good uh, uh, content. So my experience in Twitter is not that good. I would recommend mostly LinkedIn, but I know that uh, if you follow Kiki, you should also get some good content. Mm -hmm. uh, and buy my book. <laughs> I, I will, I will. Just send me the link. Uh, yeah. uh, Rafael, by the way, um, I mean, just that you know, we are friends since years with Tom. Uh, Rafael also tried to apply to, to make a post with me, and he was very lucky that he didn't get it. So, so he went to do something better in Barcelona, and now he's making a fantastic career. I'm very, very proud of, of, of also of him and all the Brazilian community. But um, recommendation, uh, that's what... Um, it's hard to give. Um, um, I, 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 my students, uh, I have, and researchers are like a lot. I don't know why, to follow talks in YouTube. I, I strongly recommend you to have a look there. Apparently, many colleagues are putting, uh, you know, talks in conferences. Not only dissemination, but true talks. Uh, I don't know. Jens Eiser, for example, is putting plenty of his brilliant talks, and many other people. But I, I, I have a strong recommendation on what I said yesterday between this spirit of, of contradiction, that you, whatever you read about quantum computing, try to negate it <laughs> and to look for a counter uh, um, uh, point. Because uh, as I said, we are living times where, where uh, as Thomas said, information flows very fast, but, but it can be misleading. And, and quantum computing is full, full of, of negative hype. And, uh, and statements that, honestly, I mean, that's, that's as I said, these this recent ones about global warming or solving. I mean, th there are ways of, of, of saying provocative things by being more attached to, to the reality. Uh, but that's the times we live, uh, not only for science and technology, for politics and for everything. So, so, so let, us, let us just keep the suggestion that wherever you go, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, blogs, Try always to think that you have to balance an opinion and, and, and a direction to something that opposes that view. That's very, very healthy. You know, it's extremely, extremely healthy. Otherwise, you may be uh, uh, misled to, to develop some applications and some research lines or even uh, open companies for things that perhaps have not a strong uh, background. You know? So that's, that's the general message and, and by the book of Rafael, for sure. <laughs> So every good thing has an end. So we reach already well, past five past six. So I would like to thank all of our panel members and you for good questions. Excellent questions.